Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Monday, April 23rd, 2018. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Man, there's a lot going on. I hope you guys had a great weekend. Uh, mine was very nice. A little too short, but very nice. Anyway, so many things happening these days. I know I feel like I say that a lot these days, but it's true. Out of Arut Sheva, Iran says, nuclear deal is all or nothing. No plan B. Keep in mind about something here. Just last week, Iran was threatening Israel, saying we can bomb them anytime. We got our fingers on the trigger. We're ready to go. And did you see what happened over the weekend? Iran got hit with a 5.5 earthquake very near the Boucher nuclear power plant. And then there was this huge sandstorm. I don't know if it's resulting from the earthquake or if it was a separate incident or if they're somehow tied together. And this sandstorm hit pretty hard. I mean, several people lost their lives because they suffocated to death. But they had two earthquakes over the weekend. Iran has had six earthquakes in the last seven days, 21 earthquakes in the past 30 days. They had one within 48 hours of threatening Israel. Just food for thought. Now Iran is saying that the nuclear deal is all or nothing. There's no plan B. There's no fixing it. You've got Russia and China trying to sabotage Donald Trump's attempts to change the nuclear deal. You've got Germany and France saying, oh yeah, we need to stick with it like it is. Seems like only Donald Trump is the only one all over the world that thinks this is a horrible deal. Oh yeah, sure, give Iran a green light and $150 billion to pursue nuclear technology. Can't see anything going wrong there, can you? I thought it was like the worst deal of the millennium when I heard Obama coming up with it back in 2015 or whenever that was. I thought, really? Are you seriously doing this? And no one batted an eye. They thought, oh, that's a great program, a great deal. And I, granted, I don't know the details, but it only seems Iran's getting something out of the deal. I mean, Donald Trump's a pretty great negotiator. He's like, there's nothing in it for us. We get nothing out of this deal. They get everything, we get nothing. How do we know they're not going to turn around and use these nukes on Israel or us? Now Iran is saying it's all or nothing. You might want to watch out because Donald Trump just might say, yeah, how about nothing? No nukes for you. <laughs> um, French president saying, yeah, there's no plan B. It's, it's either this or nothing. There's no alternative. You know, Trump's been calling on European allies to fix this bad deal. And now it seems everyone's trying to push this thing ahead. Just kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it? The whole new world order, the one world government, one world religion. And here's Donald Trump seemingly standing in the way. I don't know. Let me just say for one thing for sure. Everything in here, in the Holy Bible is truth. Everything it says will happen, will happen. Everything it prophesies will come to pass. I guarantee it. Out of Haaretz, headline says, conflict between Iran and Israel will rest on the fate of the nuclear deal, with Donald Trump expected to announce if he is nixing this deal by May 12th, just two days before Israel's 70th birthday. Tehran is contending with a sluggish economy, the worst drought in 50 years, and growing public discontent, making Russia ties ever more important. Iran and Russia. Wow. Of course, I told you earlier, Israel today, Iran says it's ready to attack Israel at any moment. A senior Iran military official warned that the Islamic Republic is ready to attack Israel at any moment. They said, should Israel continue to interfere with Iran's efforts to establish a firm military foothold in Syria, the Jewish state will face overwhelming retaliation, a 
according to Brigadier General Hossein Salami. <laughs> Sorry, That's something about that name just always kind of cracks me up. Hossein Salami <laughs> and his cousin Muhammad Baloney. Um, that he said, our fingers are on the trigger. The missiles are ready to launch. At any moment the enemy wants to start something against us, we will launch. We have learned methods of overcoming our enemies. We can target our enemy's vital interests wherever we want. Okay, <clears throat> not only that, but listen to this out of Israel National News. Russia to Israel, we will not refrain from arming Syria. Russia conveys unambiguous message to Israel. There's nothing preventing it from selling the S-300 missile defense system to Syria. Selling this advanced S-300 missile defense system to Syria. Israel said last week that would cross a red line. You think Israel, when they say, hey, you cross this red line, we're going to do something. Do you think they're like Obama, where they're just all talk and no action? No, Israel backs up their talk. They back it up with action. If they say they're going to do something, you can be sure they will. Now, we might not always see it. It doesn't always manifest itself in the form of a giant rocket attack. You know, maybe it's going to be some kind of cyber attack where they take down the S-300 system through computers. Who knows? But I'm certain they won't sit on their hands watching and waiting for someone to come after them. Out of World Israel News, Russia warns Israel of catastrophic consequences for attacking the soon-to-be-deployed missile defense system in Syria. Russia's already saying, hey, yeah, we're going to go ahead and sell this to them, and you better not attack it. Hmm. You think that'll keep Israel from attacking it if they decide to carry out rocket attacks against Syria? <sighs> this is all ramping up. Seems to be getting quite heated. Out of Ynet News, Minister of National Infrastructure, Energy and Water Resources, Steinitz told Ynet News today, if Syrian President Bashar Assad allows Iran or any other element to declare war on Israel from Syrian territory, he will bear the consequences. He is endangering his regime and his own existence. Why does Iran need a military establishment in Syria? What's their purpose? Well, those of us who know God's word pretty much see where this is headed. Interesting. All this come into play. You know, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if in just the next few weeks we see Damascus completely destroyed. Wouldn't be surprised at all. It's coming. It is coming. Did you see this out of World Israel News? Israelis praised the United States for dropping the phrase occupied in references to Israeli territory. For the first time since 1979, are you listening? For the first time since 1979, the United States State Department dropped the term occupied when referring to lands captured by Israel in the 1967 Six-Day War. Israeli leaders have hailed the decision of the U.S. government to stop referring to territories captured in the Six-Day War as occupied. In its first practical expression, the annual U.S. government report on human rights worldwide in 2017 dropped references to various territories as occupied for the first time since 1979. What was that? 39 years ago? 39 years ago. Hmm. Wow. Dropped it under President Trump. The same president, who's the only one who had the backbone to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's true capital, which it is, as it has been for years. It was the capital back in Jesus' day. Looks like there's going to be some 250 U.S. delegates at the Jerusalem embassy opening. 
May 14th. It's coming up, people. What is that, like three weeks away? Oh, man, it's pretty exciting. Pretty exciting. This is still moving forward. Other countries have said, you know, Honduras, Guatemala. Uh, there's other countries that are like, yeah, we're moving our embassies to Jerusalem also. Look at all of them that just jumped in line after Trump finally had the backbone that all the others lacked. Uh, there's a picture here of signs for the U.S. Embassy. You know, in Israel, all major signage is in three languages. First of all, it's in Hebrew, then it's in Arabic, then it's in English. If you look through my Facebook page under Israeli Ministry Trip, and you see any signs, you'll notice this. The first, the top of the sign is in Hebrew, the middle is Arabic, and the bottom is American, English. It's very interesting. I'm looking at these signs saying USA Embassy. Freshly painted, freshly made, ready for the day. Wow, I'm so thankful that we get to see this day come. Oh, by the way, what it's April 23rd, almost, it's almost 11 p.m. Central Time currently. I'm still here. You guys still where you are? There was this talk that, hey, the rapture's happening today. Um, I've seen it all over Facebook. I, I kind of cringe and laugh all at the same time when I see these predictions. Uh, David Mead, this numerologist and an end time theorist, says the rapture would happen April 23rd, 2018, based on all kinds of things. And I'm just, it's like, really, people, why do people keep stepping forward and doing this? Why? They just give the rest of the world more ammo to mock Christians with these sensational claims that don't happen. Pretty soon they're going to be like, yeah, we don't believe any of the stuff the Bible says. Why should we believe what you say? You know, I saw where, um, oh, where was it? In California, they've got this bill that if it passes, could ban Bibles. What? Are you serious? Banning the Bible? Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but I'm not giving up my Bibles. I'm going to hold on to my Bibles more than I hold on to my guns. I can tell you that, because I'm not giving up my guns either. Um, that's amazing. You know, if it gets to the point to where they're going door to door confiscating Bibles, we're going to have a problem, because you're not getting my Bible. I'm sorry, you're just not. I got about 300 of them here in this room. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Not getting the Bibles. Anyway, speaking of the Bible, let's get right into it. In Luke 17, verse 5, And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. Increase our faith. The apostles asked Jesus to increase their faith. You know what? As a servant of Christ, as a follower of Christ, this is something we should also seek after. Increase our faith, Lord. Increase our faith. Some people think, well, how do you, how do, you do that? How do you increase your faith? Um, think about this. You know, the Apostle Paul spoke of running the race, uh, you know, fighting the good fight. He, he kind of used the analogy of uh, athleticism, of almost sports, if you will. Run the race, which I can totally refer to because or relate to because I've been involved in athletics my whole life pretty much. Whether it was football, basketball, baseball, track, rodeo, motocross, swimming, whatever. I love to be active. I love to kind of test myself. I like to go climb big mountains and do all kinds of things to see what I'm capable of. Um, and, you know, at some point you like to compete against other people, see if you can be better than them. And it's just kind of the way God wired me. 
especially when I was much younger and stronger and faster <laughs> and all of those things. But imagine you are the greatest race of life. You're surrounded by a crowd of witnesses that are cheering you on. And a good way to increase your faith is with an acronym of TRUST. T-R-U-S-T. -S -T. TRUST. T. Take away anything in your life that slows you down or causes you to stumble. Take it out. You can't let anything distract you. You can't let anything knock you off track. You can't let anything trip you up. Take your focus off Christ. You're running to win. So take away anything that might slow you down. R. Read God's Word. Read the Holy Bible. The Holy Bible is a, a faith-building Word of God. And the more of God's Word that you have in your heart, in your mind, and on your lips, the more strength you'll have in your spirit. You. Use the faith you have. You know, faith is like a muscle. If you don't exercise it, it won't grow. You can't just show up at church every now and then and expect to have a Moses kind of faith. You, you just can't. You got to exercise your faith every day. Exercise it every day. Have faith in God. You know, do something like uh, say, Lord, please get me to work today without any problems on the road. And then watch what happens. And then thank him when he delivers what you asked. And, and let, let there be little affirmations of God saying, hmm, your faith is getting stronger. And you got to exercise your faith. You got to use it. S, strengthen your faith with prayer, with fellowship, with like-minded believers. You know, God didn't make us to go at this thing alone. Have fellowship with other believers, whether it's at your church, at work, at school, wherever. And T, turn your eyes to Jesus. Keep your focus on Christ. If you want to increase your faith, give Jesus your undivided attention. Keep your eyes focused solely on him. I mean, Jesus knows what it takes to win a race. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Keep your eyes on him. He's the greatest example there's ever been. He's the one who can see you through. In Matthew 25, um, starting in verse 14, Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. You know the story, right? The talents. Unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, straight away took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise he that had received two, he gathered other two. And he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time the Lord of those servants comes and reckons with them. And he that had received five talents came and brought forth other five talents, saying, Lord, thou delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them Five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Let me just say, this is what we all seek to hear from the Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He also that received two talents came and said, Lord, Thou delivered unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he, which had received the one talent, came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawn. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there... Thou hast, that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I sow not, and gather where I have not strawn. 
Thou ought therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury, interest, if you will. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that has shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he has. You know, we all like to feel safe and secure, right? It's kind of a basic human need. A lot of people think they're financially secure until, you know, the transmission goes out. Oh, there's a $3,000 hit. Or uh, broken bone. Oh, wow, I didn't know it cost that much to get a bone fixed. Or some other kind of a little financial emergency that comes along. Then people start to understand, hey, uh, we're not as safe and secure as we thought we were. You know, the world will tell you financial security is found in a bank or a retirement fund, but it's actually found in a relationship with the one who owns everything in heaven and earth. I mean, God's not too busy running the universe to be concerned with your financial situation. God cares about every aspect of your life, every detail of your life, including your safety, your health, your economic security. Some people are like, are you sure about this, Daryl? Oh, uh, I mean, the Bible tells us that it pleases the Lord to prosper his servants. Pleases the Lord to prosper his servants. What is that, Psalm 97, verse 10 or thereabouts? I know some of you will ask, so let me just, or is it 37? Anybody else have problems keeping numbers straight? Um, it's Psalm 37 or 35. Let's back this other way. See, I'm glad I looked because I would have misquoted and some of you would have been just like <laughs> giving me a hard time for misquoting, as well you should. Okay, Psalm 35, verse 27, the last part says, Let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Psalm 35, verse 27. Okay. I mean, everything under heaven and earth belongs to God. I think... People need to understand this, trusting him, and understanding when it comes to your finances. There's some things that should help govern the way you think about it. Number one, it all belongs to God, okay? Number two, we're managers of God's possessions. We're stewards in charge of what he sends our way. You might think, oh, well, Daryl, I go to work and I work 40, 50 hours a week. What I get is mine. I get it on my own sweat. You might be careful if that's the way you think. Um, we are responsible. And one day we're going to give an account to God for the way we used his resources, for how we spent our time on earth, for how we were ambassadors of the kingdom, how we shared the good news of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. I think true financial security only comes when we use God's money the way he purposes it. Purposes it? The way he intends it. <laughs> he alone knows the future. He has the power to provide what we need. You know, we might come up with some kind of strategy for financial gain, but it's only backed by human effort and wisdom, which... Let's face it, isn't all that great. Even the ones who say they're great at it have difficult times. I have stopped trying to make a lot of money a long time ago. Um, I, many of you know I used to be quite big in the acting business. Um, my degree is in performing arts. I came out of college and was immediately in like a dozen episodes of the TV show Dallas in the mid 80s, a uh, very popular show for those of you too young to remember. <laughs> um, 
got to work in a lot of movies and over a hundred commercials and all kinds of things. I was actually doing pretty well, thinking I was working my way up. But let me tell you, Hollywood is a dirty place. It's true, most of the stories you hear, <clears throat> um, people promising you things if you would just do something for them, and it got to the point I was like, you know, I, I'm not going to sacrifice my integrity and my eternal life for a few moments of glory. <clears throat> so, at that point, uh, I started only doing things that would glorify the Lord. So, you can imagine, less and less work came along that I would actually want to be involved in. And then at some point, the Lord let me know, Hey, Daryl, I was just training you to share the gospel with people. I was just training you to be comfortable in front of a camera so you could do what you're doing now. We need to trust in the Lord's provision and obey Him and rest in the knowledge that God does provide for His children. Um, <clears throat> those Israelites wandering in the desert for 40 years, they couldn't gather enough food for the next day. They could only gather what they could eat that day because they had to trust in the Lord each and every day. Okay, God still performs miracles today. Same God, yesterday, today, and forever. In Mark 16, verse 20, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. The Lord confirmed the preaching of his word with miracles. You know, if, if Jesus and these, these Christians in the first century needed the word confirmed with miracles, like Hebrews 2, verse 4 says, then guess what? <laughs> Maybe we do too. Um, there is no scripture that says these miracles have stopped or passed away. I know there's some people that'll say, oh, well, you know, they've interpreted that which is perfect in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 10. Um, is that it? 1 Corinthians 13, verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. They, they think that which is perfect is being the complete Holy Bible. This has led them to think that the gifts of the Spirit have stopped. They haven't. God's Word is perfect, Psalm 19, verse 7 tells us. It's not the perfect thing, though, that's referred to here, I don't think. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 does say that tongues shall cease, but it won't happen until that which is perfect is come. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12 um, Paul says that when that which is perfect is come, we shall see face to face. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Hmm. Ah, oh, sure, you're going to get those people that say, oh, this is all symbolic. It's not literal. It's not literally face to face. But then the next comparison in this verse says, that which is perfect, when that which is perfect is come, we shall know all things, even as we also are known. I don't think there's any other way to interpret this except as a description of when we stand before our Lord and Savior, standing before him face to face, after we leave this earth and step foot in front of him, we'll be face to face and we'll know all things, even as we also are known. Verse 8 says that at the time prophecies fail and tongues cease, knowledge will vanish away. I think this is probably talking about in the next life, or the new heaven, the new earth, because the signs of the end times is that knowledge shall increase, Daniel 12, verse 4. So I think the that which is perfect is come that Paul speaks of isn't speaking of the Bible. I think it has to either be our glorified body or, or Jesus at his second coming. So either way... I think these verses let us know that until that which is perfect is come, tongues and prophecy will still remain. They're still valid gifts, even today. And I think God is still willing to show signs and miracles with the preaching of his word. I'm going to trust God's word 
over man's interpretation of it every time. You know, God's word isn't so tricky, so difficult, so confusing that you can't understand it. I think some people just try to dissect it so much that they can't grasp sometimes the simplicity of it. I came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior at the age of seven. If a child can understand that Jesus died to save me, I think it can't be all that difficult. Do you know this truth? He's the only name under heaven by which you must be saved. He's the only way to God the Father. He said so himself. Jesus couldn't lie. He lived a life without sin. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God the Father but by me. John 14, 6. I hope you know this truth because your everlasting life depends on it. God bless you guys. Good Lord willing. I'll see you again tomorrow.